a big goal for me with vitriol was to be to embody that almost revelation of masculinity while still trying to reconcile the vulnerability of the true seeking individual, someone who's looking for a higher self mm. with like that, ah, that vulnerability is so integral to like the masculine journey. And I feel like that is more of a, that is a facet of the experience that, that metal doesn't, often give a voice to. Greetings, Legion, and welcome to a brand new episode of Into the Necrosphere. My guest this week is Kyle Rasmussen of one of the most talked about bands in extreme music today. Uh, the band, of course, is Vitriol. They have got a brand new album out called Suffer and Become that's available on Century Media Records right now. I'm not even going to go into detail about uh, the content of the 90-minute conversation that Kyle and I had, but I will issue this warning. If you're a sensitive soul, this might not be the chat for you. Um, there are many topics that were covered. Many of them were heartfelt. Uh, some of them were sobering or s sobering and truthful. Uh, some of them were very spicy. Uh, I know my audience well enough to know that you guys are going to absolutely fucking love it. But before we get to that, when my friend Marco of the band Stellar Master Elite drops me a line and tells me to check out a band, I usually listen because the man has impeccable taste. Uh, he recently told me to check out a new band featuring uh, the drummer of a criminally underrated German black metal band called Sonic Rain. They have sadly broken up. Uh, but the drummer in question, Sebastian Schneider, is back uh, with a project called Twilight Sun. Uh, they've got a new EP out called Stigmata Children, or at least uh, by the time that you listen to this, it should be out. Uh, it is going to be released on a label called House of Incantation, and you're about to hear the title track off of that record right now.
That was Twilight Sun with Stigmata Children off the EP of the same name. By the time that you listen to this, it should be available, and I'll post a link to their Bandcamp in the description to the podcast. So if you head over there and you buy yourself anything, you be sure to let them know who sent you. If you are new to the podcast, then make sure that you smack that subscribe button on your platform of choice like it owes you money. Uh, Head over to Instagram, Facebook, and X if you want to follow the show on there. And also make your way over to the Teespring store. Uh, Then again, link in the description to the podcast and you can avail yourself of some of the fine, high quality, fashion forward merchandise uh, that is available on there that will help support the podcast and uh, will help me do things like like the minor aesthetic upgrades that you've seen over the course of the last three years. Um, Very critically, you should be following my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. We're a cabal of men uh, focused on producing high quality content virtually seven days a week. And we start on a Monday with Horror Wolf 666, hosted by the inimitable Brandon Legion. Yours truly casts hexes and slays poses on Into the Necrosphere every Tuesday. Every Wednesday, Sensei Mike Hill brings you another episode of his long-running show, Everything Went Black. He returns every Thursday alongside his co-hosts, uh, Sheriff Mike Scandado and Professor Jeff Kashid, with my favorite podcast of the week, Necromaniacs. This past week, they reviewed the 1986 classic, The Hitcher. It is always a massively entertaining, uh, huge informative uh listen and it is a mainstay on my rotation it should be a mainstay on yours as well also on a thursday and a sunday the reverend carl Hikara, the sinister minister takes you on a curated tour of the weird arcane and esoteric with his podcast soul Knox, and then finally the man they call cheyenne of the band trivax uh, drops an episode of iblis manifestations his podcast when you least expect it so make sure you follow all of my horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse and make sure you stick around after my conversation with kyle because this week on the weekly news rant uh, we are rounding up the latest singles by dear side um on fod uh, high on fire and many others for judgment before we get to that though buckle up because this is kyle rasmussen of vitriol yeah so as we were saying before i hit record d- daring thing wearing an inquisition t-shirt but i think i think the audience of this podcast probably gets where both you and i are coming from you know you you ignore the yeah possible indiscretion the alleged indiscretions of the individual previously but i mean there is no taking away from the fact that the guy is fucking immensely talented as a guitar player and as a riff writer and as much as you know the uh the the previous record to this one wasn't you know acquisition at their best um this new one veneration of medieval mysticism and cosmological violence is a fucking belter i mean it's it's absolutely brilliant yeah man i mean i I don't really make like exceptions, you know, I just, I'm pretty hardline about morality and art having nothing to do with one another, you know, I I just, it's, I've had very in-depth nuanced conversations about this, but like the, the simplest statement that I stand by is just one has simply nothing to do with the other, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, to, to, talk about the indiscretions head on like if we ever had a global opportunity to commit a pedophilic genocide i would i would be uh, in favor of that and that might mean if if that means we don't get inquisition records that's a shame but (laughs) like like it it is what it is that's that's the lesser of the you know that's but until that day comes I'm not going to stop listening because me listening to an inquisition record has nothing to do with what that guy does on his computer. I don't know if anyone's naive enough to think that. Oh God. If anyone's naive enough to think that four out of five people who shit you enjoy, right? Uh, Whether it be their art or their product or the fruits of their business, the four out of five of those people don't do things in their private time that you find absolutely reprehensible. Mm. It is like, it's, you have to be a child to think that way, you know? Um, So we're wading into this weird climate where it's like, 
you you're only guilty of the stuff that you're caught for yeah uh, and then in that way and not to get totally off track but it's it's also just very if you take a step back and you see how biased the whole thing is you know we have uh, it's really only like white european dudes in face paint that are getting a hard time about this shit. Yeah. you know what yeah. i mean like where people like in other genres you know we got a guy in an old christian metalcore band that's doing fine after he commissioned someone to murder his wife mm-hmm. but nope nobody cares about that you know i was about I mean? to say that i mean you know we, we, we're talking about tim lambesis he he seems to have just kind of gotten off scot-free and it's yeah. I, I've, I've always been confused about that it's like okay so anyone in a black metal band or anyone in a in a death metal band who's stepped out of line will never hear the end of it you know career ruined reputation in tatters yeah tim lambesis abs- absolutely fine and and you look further afield into you know various other genres you know, whether it be rap or whether it be anything else, you know, and a lot of these dudes, you know, have gotten, you know, they've gotten caught doing incredibly sketchy shit. Oh my God. To forget about it and just put it to one side. The dude from Modest Mouse, he lives here and he's not allowed to be like 60 feet from a fucking school. Yeah. You know, that dude has like three DUIs and it has weird sex shit on his fucking record. And Modest Mouse is doing just fine. The reality yeah. is extreme metal is a moral scapegoat for a world that wants to feel good wants to feel better about who they are because it's the michael jackson syndrome right like no one no one doesn't know that michael jackson was fucking kids left and right Mm -hmm. but we all compartmentalize that and everyone's fine everyone's gonna not no one's gonna turn thriller off when it comes on the radio Mm -hmm. you know what i mean because it's just too hard there's too much there's too Michael Jackson to these people had too much to offer. So it's a net. It's a game of like, uh, are you taking more from us than you're giving? And metal is such an easy target because nobody likes our music anyway. You know what I mean? Especially black metal, like, mm. like people outside of the scene, there's nothing appealing to them anyway. It doesn't sound good to them. Uh, uh so it's, it's, it's easy to to kind of deposit all of the the sins of the the world of art into this one little kid that's easy to shove in a locker so to speak you know what i mean because they don't make yeah. any money it's easy yeah. it's yeah. easy to protest it's easy to protest an industry that doesn't make any fucking money but the second you start filling someone's pockets they don't give a shit they're gonna let you do what you want to do i i also feel like social media yeah, it's kind of gamified the, the the whole process of you know attempting to cancel people because in some ways it's almost like something you know someone says something in an, in an interview they step out of line they step outside of the the you know the accepted narrative and then you know all of a sudden everyone is like okay we're on top of this guy the, the crosshairs are on him or the crosshairs are on her and it's it's like it's a race to try and find what they can ding the person for and as soon as they as soon as they've got it you know it's all over uh, all over twitter it's all over instagram it's all over reddit and it's like okay how quickly can we pile on and completely yeah. wreck this person's life yeah yeah for sure i think there's that I, I, and i think it's part of it's competitive and another part of it is a is it's a chronic means for people to prevent if you're constantly criticizing other people um you're clogging up the airwaves so people can't criticize you mm-hmm. like that's usually what's it's so people don't have to look at themselves and so other people don't have to look at them you know if we just keep this witch hunt going so to mm-hmm. speak but the the biggest problem for me is it's just like if <sighs> these issues become nuanced enough that especially like let's keep it in the context of black metal for 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 a moment like i had a post on my instagram last year where i was wearing a hate forest t-shirt and that was a big hullabaloo you know um and i addressed it head on i engaged in difficult conversation with a lot of people on that post um 
and the cognitive dissonance that is at play with the cancel culture is fucking staggering like the hypocrisy you know like the people that will have an issue with hate forest but be wearing like a drood t-shirt you know or uh they don't understand americans this is especially a problem here in america because things like um national socialism or any kind of right-wing political ideology is very lazily and clumsily associated with you know just like dumb racism uh the ku klux klan uh fucking uh you know your 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 classic uninformed bigot xenophobe you know and so when they when a when a young american kid that has been fed our rhetoric uh hears of a of a ukrainian band that self-identified as national socialist mm. like, oh my god dude this is a fucking we can't this is a you know these guys are it's that what's going on the political climate in the ukraine right and this is this is pretty poetic because this happened like literally this conversation about my hate forest t-shirt happened like a month or two before the conflict happened mm. in ukraine and it's like i wonder how differently that conversation would go now is like how <sighs> you, uh, this isn't me just to be clear to anyone who's listening this isn't me making an argument for any kind of political system i'm not yeah. i don't consider myself a right winger i don't consider myself a left winger um but it's important when you look at the history the the political tides of of any culture you're going to see an ebb and flow of conservative values and liberal values and all of these things that answer that are an answer to the current climate so just as a thought experiment i encourage people to consider it doesn't mean you got to be okay with it but consider that being a national socialist in america in 2024 might say something very differently about your character than being a national socialist in the ukraine in 2024 mm -hmm. they're not the same thing you know what i mean and they're not motivated by the same uh current issues in in their i don't know this is a this has nothing to do with metal but anyway <laughs> no i mean i think it's you know it it's it, it's it's relevant to the topic and you know this is the, the the you know conversations on this podcast very often tend to be about a lot of very random shit so don't yeah. uh, you know don't, the, the 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 track is what it is wherever we lay it but i mean i i think one of the points you're making is around the fluidity of people's moral compass in in modern society and it seems like you know people will they'll they'll absolutely flip out if you dare to profess to enjoy you know any bosom record but if you if you were to go back and say hey man i really like shout of the devil by uh, you know by motley crew no one bats an eyelid even though vince neil actually killed somebody yeah so you know, and uh, you you can look at Ozzy Osbourne and the, the the scandals with him. I mean, you know, you very, um, you know, he very famously tried to strangle and murder his wife while he was high. So yeah. you know, there's all these guys that that you know are of a certain stature that get a pass on just about everything. Mm -hmm. But anybody else that that that's in the in the in the periphery, anything that they anything that they do that's you know where they color outside the lines. They you know have a bad day. Maybe some some wayward ideas you know permeate their thinking. These these guys are not only wrong, but it's almost like you know that kind of typical communist blood blood guilt. Where if you have anything to do, if you even you you know if, if as a band you performed once on the same stage as that band, you're in trouble too. And Inquisition's a great example of that. Uh, my friend Ralph, who's an author. And I mean, Ralph is is as left wing as it as it gets. He, uh, I mean, they authors had shows cancelled multiple times, literally for playing one show with Inquisition, one wow. show. And and the craziest thing about it is they they played the show in I think it was 2018 or two, 2017 2018. And when I was talking to him about it, I said like a lot of people forget that I and I very clearly remember this. There was a Rolling Stone article about the big you know black metal up and comers, the next generation of black metal, and they pointed to Inquisition and said you know, Inquisition is one of the you know next big things in black metal. 
I'll never forget that. It's like, who on earth wouldn't have wanted to be playing with those guys at that time? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did. I mean, our first, our first live show was opening for Inquisition. And that was such an honor. I still have the poster in my garage. You know? Your first I, show? You, my, for wow. Our first live show was open like open open dry open for inquisition and uh uh our first show back our first first show was 2012 with nile and then the band like broke up it was our first and only show and then when we reformed vitriol as i think of it uh with scott walker our first show was with uh inquisition of the boss nova ballroom mm. i don't know it's 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 easy to shit on stuff that you just don't people are not rational they're emotional you know and if if, if you can do a, a lot of work throughout your lifetime to become self-aware of the tricks that your emotions play on your mind and you're still going to have a hard time seeing objectively through them and mm -hmm. that's that's just why i don't have any patience left for this whole thing of like oh do we is this band okay is this band okay it's like none of this is about who's okay this is about who's convenient enough to dislike yeah right who's who's what's going to cost you the least amount of your own personal joy like i get it you don't like burzum anyway it sounds like goblin music to you but some of us see the magic you know like and if you saw the magic you wouldn't if you have an issue with someone wearing a burzum t-shirt and you watch a mel gibson movie go fuck yourself <laughs> yeah 100 that's it i, I was just about to say yourself. too you go back through the history books and read up about countless famous composers i mean you know composers that are held up in the world of classical music as you know the most influential you know beethoven bach mozart there are massive scandals in in their in their history of of varying shapes and sizes so like i what I, i've had this conversation with a friend of mine many times as well and i've said to him when it comes to extreme music the one thing you have to understand i think people that come from a place where maybe they they they're more and I, I speak under correction, I'm not a psych psychologist. So I'm going to say, if left-brained is more creative and right-brained is more logical, if they're more right-brained, one of the things they don't necessarily get about people in bands are a lot of these folks have various demons they wrestle with, and they use music as an outlet to express that, or at least as a, as a, as a release for that. And some of their behavior might not make sense to you, but it doesn't matter, because you wouldn't be able to step into their shoes and and do what they do, creatively speaking. You're just not yeah. wired that way. Yeah. So to impose your thinking on them, you know, and and, ex and expect them to 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 live a certain way or behave a certain way or or, or think a certain way, it's farcical. It's ridiculous. They wouldn't it's, be who they are if they if 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 they thought the way that you thought. Well, it just goes to, I mean, the, the quickest way that you can identify if someone doesn't get what this is, or at least doesn't believe what this is, is, is that, that train of thought, this idea that if you have the idea that all of, like, let me put it this way, sorry, I'm trying to, no, it, no, it's fine. The topics that are uh, important to me, I get excited and I have a hard time to, uh, being concise sometimes. But um, in order to make this music authentically, you know, in order to make this kind of art and tell the truth, you have to come from a, lo a location, you know, a psychological, emotional, spiritual position that has... God damn it, what am I trying to say? Um, you can't get in the mud without getting dirty. You know what I mean? And anybody who who thinks that they get something from this kind of art um, while wanting to have your cake and eat it too, so to speak, to sanitize the identities of the people, um, 
it, look, I'm not saying give reckless permission to people that make metal you like, yeah. but I'm yeah. saying be a grown up and understand that like, yeah, the guy who made eight albums about murdering women, like hit his wife once. Yeah. Don't be shocked by that. You know what I mean? Like, then don't listen to this fucking music. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, don't, because people are working shit out, man. You know, and they're not, it's, it's just, it shows, it just shocks me. It shocks me how, how little people understand how real this is for so many of us. Mm. Um, and it's really frustrating. It's, you don't have to get it. People like you and I, we're used to people not getting it, but don't like come into our house and and tell us that we don't get it yeah. you know what i mean tell us tell us don't come into our house and tell us you don't like the color of the drapes exactly like, you know like i i've i've always felt with with metal I and mean, i i discovered metal when i was like like i was always drawn to darker and and heavier and more abrasive music always and i've been obsessed with music since i was you know really really young like two three years old and I, I, I you know, properly discovered metal through ACDC when I was nine years old. But as I've grown older, one of the things I've come to realize is there are there are people who are almost in a way born into this. Like they, they most of them will tell you the same story. I always had a like I, I was always drawn towards darker, more abrasive, more aggressive music. Like the 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 that kind of particular energy that's in that's that's in metal they were always drawn to that they'll never they'll it'll it'll never go away they'll never grow out of it they'll they'll never be it's not a passing phase like probably many of their parents hope it, it's it's something that's going to be with them forever but there's quite a significant contingent of people that that are drawn to metal that i think they're drawn to it because they don't they feel like they don't have a place in society maybe they don't fit in at school maybe mm -hmm. they don't fit into their families and metal generally speaking you know, for all of the fucking flack that it gets online, it's it's a pretty accepting scene. I've yeah. never once seen somebody try and you know walk up to somebody wearing a metal T-shirt and befriend them and and be told to fuck off or anything like that. There's none of that. None of the snobbery that you get from you know if you go to a typical bar. I mean, you right. know, there's, there's there's certain there's certain types of people that are going to look down on their nose at you if you got tattoos, if you're not wearing designer clothing, whatever the case. But you don't get that in metal. But I think for those people, and again, unfortunately, it's quite a large contingent of, of of the scene, in my view. They they will be they'll stick around for about three four years. They'll kind of extract what they need from it, and then they'll then then they'll quote unquote grow out of it. You'll meet you'll run into them later on. Hey, how's it going? What are you listening to right now? Or oh, nothing. I don't. You know, I'm, I'm into Oasis now. You know, it's really more my my thing. They seem to see, they seem to me to be in this day and age the ones who are also the the people out on x and every and everything else shouting about this band being bad this band being wrong yeah. i had a i had an incident on that i read up on about on reddit i was talking to john from black braid and we were just going we were going through lyrics he'd written and stuff like that and i i, I threw this comment out and said i think that uh i think i think that randy blythe from lamb, lamb of god is a fantastic lyricist i said even though i can't stand the man and the, the 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 thread effectively goes from, I don't understand why he said I hate him as a human being to well he must be right wing. <laughs> like, yeah, so that's that's the kind of thinking that I think these fucking Johnny Come Latelys bring, and they leave. But unfortunately, yeah. there always seems to be a consistent number of them, you know, polluting yeah. the polluting the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they it's it's a self you know metal is a self uh regulating uh environment you know i if if it doesn't if you if it's not for you you will either leave or it will kind of repel you on its own you know what i mean and it's always you're always getting people that are diving in and trying to see if it's for them. And then they kind of make a mess when they're in there because it's not for them. Because it's like what you said, when there are people that you can't remove that siren song from within them. You know what I mean? There's just always that gravity from an early age. And 
like for me making this music, I, and hopefully anyone making dark, difficult art, if you're not a total nihilistic piece of shit, you ask yourself, what is this doing? You know, like, am I having, am I, am I having a cultivating effect on the people that I'm trying to talk to, or am I just dragging them deeper down into something that isn't helping either of us? And I think after asking myself that question a lot about my relationship with my music of what it's doing for me, I realized that at least this is my opinion that you can't, you can't implant something in, in someone, you know, you can't take a darkness. You can't make a darkness in your music and, and push it onto somebody, a, a listener and turn them into something or, or put something in them that wasn't already there. I think yep. what art has the power of doing is to awake or inflame things that were already within them. Mm. And we can see that experience when we're young and we find this music in the first place, you know, like most of us, like you and I, I don't know what your experience was, but mine was kind of like a, uh, an immediate excitement and intimidation that I kind of wanted to keep probing into and the other people in my life, um, were not, it, it was just the intimidation. It wasn't the excitement. The excitement wasn't there. Mm. And I think, um, what am I trying to say? I'm sorry. I'm popping all around this interview. I'm not that's being, fine. Fine. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. But, well, I, I, so I was going to ask you actually, what, what was your start? Ex by the way, before you answer that question, exactly as you described it there, the first time I heard Thunderstruck, which was, that was the real, like, fuck this is like i i i've described it before on the podcast it was like i'd found a, a missing limb it was yeah. like all of a sudden it was like this i i i always knew this was somehow subconsciously i always knew this was this was going to be my thing this is this is the music that i'm that 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 makes me feel alive and in years since my music taste has expanded pretty significantly I, you know i listen to a lot of different stuff now but you know if i listen to a record like suffer and become when i heard the first single you guys put out it's that same that same excitement that's that's sparked oh, yeah. in me i knew when when i heard the first single to this i immediately messaged katie and i said this is going to be a fucking massive album like this is going to be a landmark record you can just you you can tell it's everything is there i feel the way I felt when I heard the last Ecclesi record, the last Mentor, um, the last Ulcerate. There's just certain records that you know are going to be great, and as soon as you, like, you just know when you hear it. Um, but I, that was for me when I heard Thunderstruck. It was like it, it was like every single part of me came alive in a way that I, I had not ever. I knew that it was there, but I, you understand what I mean? It was like I I, 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 I'd, I'd not, I'd not physically felt that that feeling up until that point. That's a beautiful way of putting it. You know, it's like, it's, that's a great way of describing it is it, it telling you something, get almost like finding, finding your tribe artistically is like finding the words to describe something you've already been feeling this whole time. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's being, it's the, it's, it's the experience of being seen for me. Like that was when I felt, when I found metal, that's the best way I can describe it is I felt seen by something. Like something was reflecting my interior world back at me in a way that nothing else in my life was at the time. You know, I felt like, um, you know, especially growing up in, in front of a TV, uh, you know, uh, poor American kid growing up in front of a TV, uh, raised by cable, t cable television. Um, you know, all the fluffy shit that's coming at you. Um, very confusing because, you know, mm -hmm. my, my, my environment didn't look like that. You know, my household didn't look like the full house family or the boy meets world family or the, yeah. uh, you know, what, what the fuck, what, whatever. Um, and that was that dissonance was it, when you're young, you don't, it just felt 
alienating, you know, and I didn't really know why. And then when I found metal, um, man, I mean, it was, uh, I was very fortunate to have had a metalhead stepfather, uh, who I still have a relationship with. And he showed me Metallica, uh, when I was six. And that was my most formative memory with music. Um, I remember, I mean, it's one of my earliest memories in life, period. Um, was sitting on the carpet, listening to that boom box, specifically listening to Four Horsemen. Um, and there was something about the energy, man. And it was like, it wasn't just the energy. It was, it was the first thing I heard that didn't sound like it was from this world. Hmm. It was like superhero music almost uh, is how I could describe it as a kid. I'm like, Oh, this isn't, this is like from the future or from space or something, man. And, uh, that's where it all started. And then when I was got into my early preteens, 10, 11, I, uh, cause my dad liked, listen to the modern like new metal stuff too so he and i got really into uh corn and slipknot um and that and i'm actually really grateful for that period in my listening phase because there was so much emotion in that stuff mm. and i think i think my early relationship with you know i don't that early corn stuff was real bad um <laughs> I, I don't like corn but I have, a yeah. soft spot. I have a soft spot in my heart for corn because the role that they played in my development. Uh, I still think Slipknot has some fucking bangers, but um, uh, that that intense emotion at that early age, it was just the perfect. That set me up for something, and then it all crystallized when I heard um, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> uh, not the greatest death metal band ever, but Six Feet Under. I heard. Oh yeah, what what six feet under album you referring to? I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was Maximum Violence. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, I think it was like, I think the track was. Fuck, which one was it? I think it might have been Torture Killer. I I think I I was about to say that. So (laughs) a there are a couple of fucking badass songs on that album oh yeah killer being the most badass of them all dude it's so catchy it's like one of those it's like i mean who doesn't still hear as i as i fuck the holes i cut into you like are you kidding me once fuck yeah fucking i mean nowadays you know modern day six feet under not not really on on the on the level but there were some fucking great songs on maximum violence oh, and, yeah. on Path and on haunted haunted is great if anyone yeah. who's listening hasn't heard haunted i got one of my friends so fucking good like hardcore death metal like nerd total elitist and shits on six feet under all the time and we we're at a party and everyone was just like putting shit on and i put on a track from haunted and he was like oh this is sick what's this <laughs> i bumped him out real hard and i was like got you motherfucker six feet under um yeah that first fucking is thrashy death metal it's like very very sick um mm-hmm. and uh the bong rips just kept hitting as the albums went on and it kept slowing down and slowing down but okay. yeah maximum violence anyway yeah i uh that was when i heard chris barnes's vocals that was uh the first time i ever heard death metal vocals um and that was my my come to satan moment you know what i mean that was my like eureka moment i was like oh my god what the fuck like like it was like up until that point i was looking for stuff that was more intense and it was all like in increments like steady increments and then I heard six feet and then I heard death metal and it was like, boom, mm. it was just, I was like, oh, I was, I was like, this is my whole thing now. This is what my life is about. It's over mm. for me. 
One thing just about new metal, I mean, a lot of people hate on it. And I it, I had a friend of mine on the podcast like many, many episodes ago. We were actually, we did a whole episode about Woodstock 99. Um, and right at the end, he's like, okay, I'm going to do something with you. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you the names of new metal bands. You tell me what you like and what you don't like. It turned out that there were, you know, 98% of them I disliked quite intensely. But one thing that I, I, I will say about some, of the new metal bands that they weren't terrible is they they did have one thing that i i have always appreciated and that's this very like driving groove and i still hear it kind of creep up in songs from from time to time maybe not like you know not like a corn groove where it's you know like a two-note riff but just that rolling like scumbag beat you know that that that, that mid-tempo rolling beat sometimes it's, it, it 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 rears its head in extreme music today and i'm like i bet at some point you dug on Dark Days by Cold Chamber. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, or you listen to a couple of Deftones albums because you you've got there's something there that I can I can hear at some point. You you thought, you know, this this White Pony album is, you know, that's my jam. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think with any genre, you're gonna have I mean, for me, Slipknot's kind of that band where um it, new metal is is tough because it's it's a genre that's engineered to be marketable. That's the whole point. Uh, but then there are bands, you, the majority of those bands are going to exist to be marketable. And then some of those bands are just going to be there because they happen to be marketable. Mm. You know, and I think Slipknot was one of these examples. I think Slipknot was a pretty like pure idea. Like those guys, the the extent to which those guys were hurting themselves every night in those early, like there was at least one hospital trip every night. Like in those early Slipknot days, those guys were just fucking, but because of that, it was, it was marketable. So I think you're going to have those, um, bands that just like the grunge thing, you know, like Alice in Chains was like a secret metal band in a grunge scene, you know? And I think that's why, uh, uh, new metal has their Alice in Chains you know, mm. their, their secret heaters. Well, my my, I, I wouldn't even refer to it as a guilty pleasure because I don't I don't consider it a guilty pleasure. But an album that I, anyone who wants to give me any lip about the fact that I love it as much as I do can fuck right off. Was Constant Death Trip by Static X. Okay. I don't like anything else in their in their back catalog, but that album to me, I mean, is just it's knuckle dragging, just groove. I mean, they called it death disco. I remember when it came out, but I mean, every single song is, is, is basically one note. It's just, it's just rhythm played on guitar, but I, I love it. I've absolutely, oh, I got to check it out. Our, my Adam, my co my, my, my ride or die in vitriol, all the other vocalist and bass player, he, uh, big new metal, like he doesn't listen to it anymore, but like he went and saw static X and fear factory, you know, like, uh, he, it he still has it. Um, he grew up, you know, out in the fucking sticks in California, you know, they didn't have computers and shit. So, you know, you grew up in an environment like that, you're going to just hear what's on the radio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he has, a, I mean, Mudvayne is why he started playing bass. Mm -hmm. He played guitar until he heard Mudvayne and he was like, oh shit, why, why aren't more people doing that? So... I, I, what made you take up the guitar? Because I've I've watched some of your playthrough videos, and I mean, you you just have to listen to any of the or, you know, e either of the two Vitriol records to know you 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 what they would call reasonably proficient. <laughs> so, how old were you when you picked up a guitar? Like, what made you start playing? Uh, I mean, same answer as metal. I, I it was really that that day listening to Metallica when I was six. I mean, it sounds like a a line but like i really sincerely truthfully have wanted to be a lead metal guitar player since i was six years old like that's been my consistent dream um because i was just so dazzled by kirk hammett's in the pocket blues lead playing for some reason <laughs> like wasn't yeah not the most amazing stuff now but um yeah it was to me that was just the heart of the music that i loved you know um like all the identity was there so i just wanted to be able to be i wanted to be a magician you know that's how i saw it it's like there are these people that are making 
like creating these worlds that I'm living in on their albums. I'm like, how mm. cool would it be to make my own worlds? Mm. You know, it had less to do with wanting to be like a shredder or whatever, and it had more to do with, or even being in a band it had more to do with like creation, just getting really excited about world building. Um, and then I'm just an obsessive person. Uh, so my proficiency at the instrument, I think it's just a product of me like obsessing over it. Um, and I started playing when I was 13. 13. Yeah. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? 35. 35. Okay. And, and on, on average, how many hours a day would you say you, you'd spend? Firstly, how, how much, how many hours a day would you say you spend on a guitar now? And when you were younger, how much time would you invest in, in practicing and, and playing? It's all over the place. Like, um, I have played guitar probably five times in the last five months. <laughs> because before that, I was recording guitar for 40 to 50 hours a week for nine months straight when I was finishing Suffer and Become. Jesus yeah so it was it's a welcome break um i yeah i kind of have feast and famine a feast and famine relationship with my guitar you know i'll be I'll, um and now that i'm a touring musician most of my practice occurs on the road you know like you're playing every fucking night i don't really do a lot i've never been one to sit and like practice scales or but whenever i practice there's always a a more practical goal like being able to play a part that i wrote mm -hmm. you know or um writing itself you know like a big reason why uh vitriol's music is complicated is because i never had the interest to learn other people's music mm -hmm. or like learn scales or learn um which I'm not bragging about. I think that's a, a weakness. Uh, I don't like that. But I, in order to make myself strive, I had to write stuff that challenged me because mm. I that was the only way I could engage myself in the instrument. Um, yeah. There's nothing, nothing about like showing up at a lesson or cracking a book or watching like a, a John Petrucci DVD. Like that just made me want to fucking die. Like it made me want to just die. Yeah. Like there's nothing less romantic to me than that about the guitar you know like and that's the guitar is very romantic to me you know it's a very like magical thing to this day it's like this esoteric machine of of you know it, it, world building uh and so i i uh I don't really know how to answer the question directly other than I practice, uh, uh, I play a lot when I'm making an album and I don't play very much when I'm not. That's the very simple answer to your question. Yeah. I, I was, I, sorry, go ahead. Partly I asked that because like I said, A, you know, I, I could, I, I've, I've, for what little guitar I've played, I, I mean, I immediately was watching you play on some of those playthrough videos and I was like, Jesus. But also I've always been, in, I, I, I've always had a great degree of admiration for guitarists that I, I, I look at and I go, you know, the guitar, I mean, it's true of, you know, anyone who's mastered an instrument, right? You know, you know, that piano, you know, the guitar, you know, those drums in so perfectly that whatever you want to express artistically or creatively, you can pick it up. And it's just, it, it, you know, you know where to go, you know, how to, you know, you know, the words quote unquote to say through your instrument to to say what you need to say which is partly and i you know i probably talk about him on just about every single episode of the podcast i mean dimebag to me dimebag yeah. at his peak like if you watch him play it, it just it blows my mind i've i've never seen somebody play with so little effort it, it, it's just yeah. like like he puts his hand to the guitar and music just flows from his fingers 
I think I think he might be the best metal guitar player of all time. And this okay. is coming from someone who's not a big Pantera fan. You know, admit like I like Pantera. I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but compared to Slayer or Metallica or you know, fuck, even t- some Testament. You know, like it was just never my. But he is a player. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I I don't. You're hard pressed to find someone who had. I can't think of anyone who has a more vocal command over there. Like he just, you yeah. you hear people say like he talks through his guitar. He does like he does. It's like he's just opening his mouth and having a conversation with you. Hmm. Uh, Dylan, the guy from Damon S Guitars who builds my guitars, um, he says all the time. He said, "Jimi Hendrix invented the chaos of heavy metal lead playing." Uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen uh, advanced it, and then Dimebag put it in the perfect heavy metal context. Mm. Like that's how my buddy Dylan sees kind of the evolution of of metal lead guitar playing, and he he agrees with you. Yeah, no, I I I would absolutely. Uh, I think that's the perfect way to to describe it. So if we if we segue into uh, suffer and become i think one of the things that impresses me so much about this record is if i think about this this anvil of just violence and brutality and relentlessness that was to bathe from the throat of cowardice and i think about the evolution into suffer and become one of the things that I, i i that strikes me the most is you somehow seem to have found a way to strip away a lot of layers of, I don't know. I don't know if it was. You, you, you might be able to clarify this. I don't know whether it was protection, whether it was self awareness, but but you've kind of gone to a layer of emotion, like naked emotion, yeah. and in some ways also maybe vulnerability that you very very rarely hear on a on a, certainly on an extreme metal album, like almost like we were just talking now about. Dimebag, you know, be you know having music flow from his fingers. There, there seems to be suffering become plays to me like something that's far less calculated and far, far more expressive than to bathe from the throat of cowardice. That that's kind of how I would describe my my interpretation of the record. That's beautiful, man. I, I mean, that might be my best to hear. <laughs> I mean, it makes me see it in it. I've never thought about it in terms of removing protection. And I think that's so cool. What a cool way of thinking about it. And I think that is uh, absolutely correct. Um, You know, I've said a handful of times, uh, a a way I've, a way I've enjoyed describing one of the core differences between these two albums is that to bathe is an album full of answers and suffer is an album full of questions. Mm. And, and there's something very arrogant and indignant and no time for conversation about the first album because it's very much in the spirit of of survival you know it has to be you know like um uh, these are all positive qualities in my opinion about the album um in the same way that in the heat of a f- battle or in the middle of a fight, you don't have time for that self inquiry, right? You have to grab a hold of what you know and push as hard as you can forward and hope that that what you have gets you there. Suffer and become is that is the dust settling. You know, it's, it's in the wake of that explosion of survival that you can sit for a moment and reflect on where you've been going, what to do now, what damage was done getting there, you know, like all of these and, and my experiences with my fans on the first album was a big influence in that. I mean, there the more I had more, more satisfying connections with the fans 
uh, the more personal the songs were on the first mm -hmm. album. You know, so songs like I Drown Nightly and Victim, the more introspective songs. Um, that's when I realized, man, I can have, going back to an earlier question, like, oh, I can have a, a cultivating effect on, you know, there are people, this music is so abrasive on its face, but there are people just like you. I mean, you, you said, uh, this feels more vulnerable, you know, and I think you'd have to, if you, if you showed this to someone who doesn't listen to extreme metal and you were to tell them this is a vulnerable album, they'd be like, think you're, fuck you're, are you talking you're about? fucking insane asylum. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. the, exactly. So the, the fact that it can, people can feel that vulnerability through, that was a really liberating thing to learn. Cause I'm like, fuck, now I can go, if people are reading this loud and clear, let me just keep lean, leaning into that transmission and see mm. see where it takes us. Is it difficult getting to that point? Like, or was it, should I, uh, rephrasing the question, was it difficult getting to that place? Like, was it a conscious thing for you to strip away those layers and, and did it, was there a process that you had to go through to get to that point? Yeah, absolutely. I want, vitriol is always, here to as a vehicle for me to figure myself out you know and it was a very focused targeted painful process of leaning into these basically interrogating the version of me from the first album you know, in a way. Um, and yeah, that was leaning into like, I, I did not expect to, to talk about like love so much on this album. Like every time that came up, I was like, is this, um, that really went hand in hand with the melody that was present on this album. These were two things I never really anticipated to be part of the vitriol landscape. Mm. Right trying to practice what I preach on the album, I had to trust my instinct and that's where my instinct was taking me. So yeah. it was, um, it, the goal, the goal was to be, to, to challenge myself as much as possible in that way, in terms of vulnerability and, and see what happens. So, uh, the, it, <laughs> I knew I want the goal was to open up, but I wasn't sure what it was going to look like once I got there. That's the way. Was saying. there was there a point at which you knew? Okay, I've kind of hit that zone. I hit that point now where this is this is sort of how far I want to take it on this record. Or this is you know you you know as you're as you're kind of going through that process of of stripping away those layers and of of opening up more. It was was there a point where you knew okay i've got it this is kind of the, I, this is where the record finds its voice in terms of the music or the lyrics or all of it anything um oh man um I'm trying to think yeah, I would say the, as far as like the narrative of the album goes, the lyrics, that was a very, it was a really interesting process because for the first time ever, uh, as a creative, the, the, the first pieces of the album that I cemented, uh, was the track list the song titles and the album title. I've never done that before. I always do it in the other direction. Um, so this album was unique in that I took all of the direction, creative direction from the, the narrative prompts of the song titles. And I don't know why they just kind of, you know, came to me, um, uh, inspiration struck. And I started pretty rapidly within a, within several months I had, 10 song titles in the order that they appear now on the album, 
um, with the song title. And that was my North Star. That was my template that told me a lot, not only about the direction of the lyrics, but the um, tone of the music. Because that's one of the benefits of writing lyrics and the music is you really get to synchronize the the voice of each of the of the lyrics and the song um and then musically i i knew one of the main concepts on the new album that was distinct from the first album was the kind of dynamic there was a lot of themes of duality on this album you know even the title suffer become you know, the flowers of sadism, um, you know, s surviving and careening, you know, so I wanted these high highs and these low lows and because I can be so, my ideas can be so all over the place. If you can't tell from this interview, uh, I like to give myself, um, I like to give myself little rules to keep myself on track. And for this album, it was finding my ends of the spectrum the highs and the lows and for me bringing in uh lower tuning on this album mm. i i use a drop pedal a pitch shifting pedal to bring the guitars quite low in parts and then i you know lean into the melody and we even do a little bit of pitch shifting up sometimes to really uh, you know kind of widescreen this bitch. yeah uh, yeah you know uh so you know that was but that's about as targeted as i got you know i like to leave room for for the thing to kind of happen to itself but i gave myself these fairly broad parameters hmm. to to operate within and you know like anyone who really cares about their work will tell you an album is never done. It's just abandoned. Um, and that's kind of what the, if, if, if century media gave me 10 years to make the album, it would be done in 10 years. You know, I'm sure it'd be one of those things. Are they, are they pretty strict with imposing deadlines on you? No, they're so great about it. I mean, I told them that was the big thing when they signed us, I was like, man, I'll give you a second album, but I can't promise you when, you know, mm. And, uh, uh, they were very cool about that. Um, you know, of course they, they want the record, so it's not like they don't reach out and ask questions or encourage you, but yeah, they're not like, if we don't get this fucking, you know, for me, it's, you got to pick when, when you're doing stuff, like there's so many people involved that you have to pick a deadline. You can't just finish an album and be like, here you go. You know, you have to things have to, they got to put you on the schedule, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's more about me picking a timeline that I find reasonable and then committing to it. And I'm not always great about that. Um, you know, making, I think I pushed this one out twice. I think it, the album, Century Media got the album like a year and a half later than I originally told them they'd get it, uh, which they didn't love, but, um, we're all happy they, with the record. I was about to say that they they probably feel it was worth the wait now. Yes, I hope so. I uh, so when I first saw the title "Suffer and Become," one of the first things that that came to mind was the 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 stay the different stages of the Euro's journey. You know, so suffer, sacrifice. Um, you know, the the Euro having to go through suffering to attain his goal. And one of the things, and and this it may be because that was my interpretation of the title, but one of the things that, that also sticks out to me about this record is in addition to feeling very, very personal, there's an, there's an intensely masculine energy about this record. Like, and there's, I mean, metal generally speaking, in my, my opinion tends to have a masculine energy in any case, but this is, this is more, tan, more palpable, more tangible, and maybe more, more current, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, if you buy into the idea, which I do, that there's there's definitely you know in, in modern society there's a crisis of masculinity there's there's oh, yeah. for sure a if not direct but certainly a subconscious expression of that on this record as well and the fact you're nodding suggests I'm not I'm not entirely off off target yeah like 
what was was there any of that in here? Is it just something personal that kind of to you that just happens to manifest in in the you know in what came out on the record? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean metal for me was so instrumental was such a revelation of masculinity for me. I mean, I was raised by. Uh, it's it's hard to separate them for me you know what i mean um let me let me think about how i answer this so i don't punish you with another uh, uh run around the bush here um well i whilst you're thinking that i will absolutely 1000% agree with you on that i think the 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 formative parts of becoming a man whether it was going through you know, schoolyard bullying, whether it was going through relationships breaking up, all that sort of stuff. Metal always seemed to be my psychologist, my, yeah. you know, my my counselor, my friend, you know, every single, th every, you know, my inspiration very often. Um, I mean, I remember a period of time, you know, when I was going through a particularly rough spot at, at, at school with schoolyard bullying, um, I mean, it was either Mouth for War or, or Killing Fields by Slayer that I woke up to every single morning. And that just got me in the right mindset. I mean, that helped yeah. literally help me through the day. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's th that masculine energy of metal, which nowadays, you know, it's downplayed and it's spoken of as toxic. You know, that's, I almost find that more offensive than I find anything else. It's like, like you realize how many young men have greatly benefited from discovering this music and having this music in their lives. Tremendously. I mean, there's a line in this new, in this album that really underlines this. It says, you awoke me uh, with the sobering cruelty of a father. And that is, you know, that kind of tough love. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's entirely wrong. I think masculinity there is a risk of extreme metal being your uh, paternal figure, you know, uh, not all. Mm. Uh, a, a big goal for me with vitriol was to be, to embody that almost revelation of masculinity while still Mm -hmm. trying to reconcile the vulnerability of the true seeking individual, someone who's looking for a higher self mm. with like that, ah, that vulnerability is so integral to like the masculine journey. And I feel like that is more of a, that is a facet of the experience that that metal doesn't often give a voice to i think I agree. so yeah, I agree. so for me on both sides i think it's important so you have the guys that are so cal calcified by um investing themselves into the 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 tribe of masculinity um that they've and this is some people especially people that are in environments where they kind of have to harden to that extent to survive um and the more sensitive that we we are uh the more we have to harden ourselves you know because it's um the world is difficult for sensitive people hmm. and uh and then on the other side i want to help welcome people who have been who see themselves as victims of masculinity because for me i grew up as a very um strange um strangely presenting young man who's raised all by women so i grew up being called a faggot i grew up being you know i was a very like effeminate kid and a very um sensitive kid and so as a young man that grew up like in my early ages kind of vilifying masculinity because i saw it as this almost like a predator hmm. um and metal was a really big 
part of me getting in touch with that masculinity and embracing that masculinity and seeing that that it wasn't an, an excess of masculinity in my environment that was a problem it was an absence of masculinity within myself you know mm -hmm. um and, and and that's hard to say it, it, that doesn't have to be that doesn't have to bring with it great shame it's just an opportunity you know it's like it wasn't my fault i didn't i didn't have a male role model you know like i didn't have i didn't I, no one showed me you know what i mean like i saw first blood when i was 16 and it was over from there you know what I mean? like, it's like, <laughs> On my first fucking Rambo movie, I'm like, oh, I get it now. Um, no, uh, only being uh, you, well. Okay, so good. so again, I I I don't think I don't think one should discount that. I remember watching. Um, so I was about I think I was 11 when I saw Predator for the first time, and I loved it so much. I, on the same day, I watched it three times. Watched rewound the tape. Watched rewound the tape. But Arnold Schwarzenegger was like my fucking like he was to me the ideal the idealized man particularly in Predator like the just the Dutch character to me was like that is what a man is meant to be like um, so yeah I totally I totally get seeing First Blood and going you know that's that's a that's a man's man <laughs> that's a fucking man dude yeah like and of course it's exaggerated it's hyperbolic it's all that stuff but you know it's that's so so were the early myths so were the greek myths you know what i mean like mm -hmm. uh, having that having that ideal to like you know uh in the the platonic form of a man you know what i mean like in the theater of your mind is it doesn't necessarily need to be john rambo but you know like it, it's a start right it gets you it gets you kind of like initiated into this idea of like okay what is what is it to be a man right mm -hmm. like what does that mean? And what 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 ends are there to strive toward? You know, and metal can be such a great uh, transmission for that ma masculine calling. Um, but but some of it is just you know reckless. Um, here's a good example: a band, a band that I discovered in metal that helped to me elevate the masculine narrative to refine it to sophisticate it beyond just like reckless hostility was primordial when i discovered oh, yeah, primordial yeah, yeah, yeah. um you know literally the album uh, where greater men have fallen that album um i was familiar with primordial before that album but that album was i see that as like help me grow up in mm -hmm. in my metal listening you know, I was like, oh man, this is talking, this is dealing with things. This is dealing with I don't know how to describe it. But um Well, I, I, I know you exactly know. what you mean Sorry. because yeah. uh, so last year actually I I did the episode this year, but so we were doing, you know, every beginning of every year on the podcast, I do my countdown, my favorite favorite records and my favorite album of this of twenty twenty three was how it ends by primordial and i i was holding up ruim um the you know the blasphemer record and, and primordial and my my the deciding point was the fact that uh, i said to uh mike hill who was doing the episode with me i was like if you're of a i i came after many 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 listens of that record i came to the conclusion if you're of a certain mindset maybe of a certain age and you're thinking of life through a certain lens at the moment there's something about how it ends that to, at least to me spoke to me at a, on a very deeply personal level of feeling like something i could relate to in a way that I, I i very rarely find myself being able to relate um you know to on with any other music um and uh, weirdly the previous record um exile amongst the ruins i felt the same way about that there was like a there was like a sadness to that record and and i think it it also was probably due to the time that it came out. You know, it came out uh, during COVID. And I remember listening to the album over and over again. You know, well, actually, it came out before COVID, but when I really discovered it was during COVID, I listened to that over and over again, like the the the, the title track. And yeah, there's like a there's a there's a depth to to Primordial's music that just is absent from a lot a lot of bands. There's a lot of yeah. great bands, but that that depth that that band has to me is just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's even in the name, you know, like the, there's something very ancestral about primordials. Mm -hmm. 
music. You know, it's very. I think for me, the the it, really gravitating toward the hero's journey experience in metal music was a was primordial gave me that the masculine epic you know what i mean like that's the best way i can put it it really felt like a um i think that's the best way i can put it you know i just and yeah and, and yeah i thought you were gonna say when you heard fuck like a beast by uh by wasp for the first time you're like yeah this is what a man's like <laughs> oh man yeah some people yeah i don't know uh <laughs> dude funny. i i i've spoken again another band i've whose praises i've sung the first four wasp albums i don't give a shit what anybody says they're fucking brilliant brilliant i've heard that i've never like my it was funny it was ta that kind of stuff was taboo in my house growing up my dad uh hated the uh you know, like the sleaze metal, hair metal yeah. stuff. Uh, but I've had several friends in the last like decade tell me, like, man, those you know those first few Wasp albums. Um, Genius! Oh, like I gotta check them out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've known. I like some. I like some rat cuts. I like some. Uh, uh, I recently discovered how sick the early Scorpions were. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, no. Very, very much so. But uh, of of that of that era, the the first couple of Wasp albums are absolutely stunning. What's your favorite? Um, one? If I have to check one out, uh, the Crimson Idol. Okay. So the Crimson Idol is kind of away from the sleaze. It's it's this conceptual record about a you know fictitious rock star, which Blackie Lawless kind of bases on himself, and uh, it's you know how the guy is all strung out, and you know it's sort of how he finds salvation. But it's uh, it's it's really really good. And then the other album that I would suggest is is Live in the Raw, which I don't actually think was a live album, even though it's presented as one. You know, that was quite commonplace in the eighties for them yeah. to do that. Um, but Live in the Raw has got some really really cool stuff on. Um, it's in particular one song, the the Manimal. And when you no, when no, when no. I when I joke about like masculinity and metal, when you yeah. hear the intro to that, you understand what I'm what I'm talking about. Yeah, you got to I mean, you got to be able to take the piss out of the stuff too. Oh, if you're, we're, it we're goes both ways. No, yeah, because it can be really fucking funny, man. I mean, it's looking at something like Man of War from the outside, I get it. You know, it's hard to. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Let me let me ask you a, a non music related question. Are you a fan of the uh, the fights? You a fan of MMA? I am, yeah. I don't follow it super. Like I, uh, Adam, is way more encyclopedic about yeah. like the fighters and all that stuff, and when who's coming up and who's on their way down. But I really enjoy it. I always, you know, I always watch the fights with him, and uh, yeah, love that shit. So, so you did do 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 you know what happened uh, in the last week with a fighter named Sean Strickland and this YouTube influencer named Sneeko? No, I know who Strickland is, but I don't know what happened. Or I don't so, know who this is. So, 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 so Sneeko, I, I had never heard of him before. I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the generation that, that watches nonsense like that. Yeah. He um, he had asked Sean Strickland to spar, and Sean Strickland warned him and said, like, don't spar with me. You're going you're gonna to get hurt. And he insisted, no, they should definitely do it. So Strickland gives in. Multiple people warn Sneeko, like, look, Sean Strickland doesn't does, – there's no soft sparring with this dude. He spars really hard. You know, you, you are going to get fucked up. Guy insists upon it. They get into the in, in into the cage. I think this was at the at the Apex, the UFC Performance Center. And uh, Strickland is walking him down, literally just like insulting him, saying like, you know, I'm going to give you three minutes, and uh, eventually it's like, you know, in one in one minute you're gonna you're gonna you're, you, this is going to turn out to be a really bad day. For the last 30, 45 seconds, he beat the fuck out of him. But now there's all this this furor online about how, you know, oh, he was he went too hard, it's unnecessary, it's bullying. And I did think to myself, having dabbled in that world myself, I, I can relate to the scenario of of sparring a professional fighter and that chasm in 
that chasm in skill level and and mindset and mentality being made abundantly clear to you. I, there was a guy named Jesse Adon who um, who used to be in the UFC. I was sparring against him one day and I accidentally, not even, it was a, a brain fart. I took the guy down when we were only supposed to be doing stand-up sparring. And as we were going down, I, I knew as, as we were going towards the floor, as soon as we get up here, what, however long is left of this round is going to be it's going to be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and I did shake the guy's hand afterwards, but I had to go to the hospital and, and like make sure that my jaw was yeah. was straight because I couldn't properly swallow water and stuff like that. Oh, but I watched yeah. that and I was like, yeah, you know, do don't 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 ask to spar somebody like this because you it's it's even even if he goes at 30%, it's th he's 30% is your 3000%. So Yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, the, the, all the talk about masculinity got me thinking about that because I've been watching clips on that on that whole shambles this uh, this week. One last thing I want to say to you, just a just a final note on the album. There's one particular line on Weaponized Lost that really spoke to me. The final the final lyric for when the voice of love is silent or unjust, one must ready the soul for war. I feel like that's that's kind of I love when lyrics are written in this this abstract way where you could you can look at that and you can impose you know however you want to feel about it i definitely think especially as you, as you mentioned primordial like now i kind of see some of the the inspiration or at least the thinking behind that as well there's there's like a there's sort of a macro meaning to that but there's also obviously there's also a very personal meaning to that lyric yeah thank you very much that's i'm glad you commented on that one that's one of my that's one of my favorite lines on the album um because it speaks to it's really it's such that that line is like a mini love song to metal too you know because going back to talking about how it reflected my world back at me um you know if anyone found themselves in a place in life where it's uh being a young person in a abusive or a toxic household that you can't escape being in a literal war zone um being you know, in, in dysfunctional foster care, whatever, you know, there are places that you can find yourself in life where the fruits of love are not accessible to you, mm. you know? Um, and that's a hard thing for people to think about and contend with, but it's a fact. And um, that's really what that line is about. You know, when the voice of love is silent, you know, when love is absent or it's unjust, when maybe the people that you're supposed to love um, can't be loved, you know, maybe the people that your instincts demand that you give your devotion to are exploiting that. Maybe they don't love you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very real necessity to be able to close yourself to that to save yourself um, is very important. And, you know, it's obviously very dangerous too, because that requires opening up after you've survived. And that's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. Um, but yeah, that's a very important hit close, hits close to home line. And I just want to, just to comment on the MMA thing, uh, I just want to say, I think it's great that he beat the fuck out of that kid. <laughs> Dude, you, you don't, like I said, you don't, you don't, you don't play with a professional fighter. It, it's just, I, I, I don't think anyone that, that doesn't know that world will properly understand it. It's just, you just I, don't, it's just not something that you should do. I think it's really important in, in this day and age where reality is so skewed and there's mm -hmm. so much more now than ever, uh, reality self the, the the distorted sense of self um what social media has done to uh people's concept of what they're capable of i think things like this are really uh, important to break through the static of nonsense and be like look this is real you know what i mean like you're not, you can have 500,000 followers and you can have a bunch of people say you're this and that or whatever. At the end of the day, a trained fighter is going to walk through you. 
Mm. And it's going to feel, you're going to feel a kind of futility that you can't, you don't have the imagination for. Mm. And that humbling experience, I mean, anyone who's been humbled like that, it's good, you know, and anyone who has their ass to meet, like, he's going to be okay. Yeah. He's going to be fine. You know, like, he's going to be okay. He might have a, you know, he might flinch the next time a guy like you know, like the dude's gonna be fine everybody you know as someone who's had their ass beat before he's gonna be fine and that that humbling force i think is a very important thing in again in a young man's life in particular i i, I would recommend to anybody get your get your son if you have one into a you know combat sports rugby anything where he's going to be in the company of other men and where the danger of physical violence is ever present because it's yeah. the, it's the ultimate it's the ultimate test you yeah. you you know even even just lifting weights you know you you like henry rollins used to say you know 200 pounds always be 200 pounds or whatever he whatever he said um you know th that's that's the ultimate test you might think your you you know you, your strength is at a certain level but as soon as you try and deadlift that, you know, <laughs> you, you try and do the go for the 350 pound deadlift and you you just not that, that thing is just not moving. You know where yeah. you stand relative to to that weight. It's the same thing with with MMA. It's the same thing with rugby. It's the same thing with anything, anything physical. And and like I said, where that that there's that threat, there's that risk of you being severely humbled by your opponent or, or by, you know, by what or whatever that opponent might be absolutely you have to it's the balance between thought and action you know and in a social media age where everyone's on the phone or on their computer and no one actually has to put their thoughts into action we're in an age of disproportionate uh a really imbalanced relationship between ideas and execution mm. and so these people um get so caught up in a world where just talking about things on the internet is enough that it, they become unmoored from reality and like this is why it's really important this is why like streetwise people such as myself have a big problem with like your classic ivory tower academic because it's all in the abstract you know what i mean like your 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 political ideas or your social ideas might be beautiful in the abstract but have you like tried to put them into action and mm. see what happens? And the individual is no different. Like you can think you're capable of something and you might be capable, but you have blind spots and weaknesses that you're not aware of until you throw yourself against that shit. And, mm. and it's the best way to protect yourself from your own ego is just to do hard shit every day. You know, just pick something hard. That's why I just think every everybody should go to the gym everybody yeah. should go to the gym and lift weights um you can learn so much about yourself in the universe by standing underneath a very heavy barbell you know like and that sounds stupid to some people but it's a guy as someone who like fancies myself a uh uh you know a, a pretty clever guy and thought i was a, a real smart kid growing up you know i've learned a lot more in the gym than most other places in the world you know um i i've often said it, the ultimate job interview to me would be to take somebody to the gym put them through an hour's workout and see how they cope you absolutely. will learn everything about that person about their resilience about their drive about the level of pride they have in themselves which again i think is a you know it's a very overlooked value in, in this world nobody nobody attaches any or very few people seem to attach any kind of value to their name and and to and to what and to the reputation that precedes them. Um, and I've never yeah. been able to understand that. Like I, I, you know, in my in my professional life, I often talk to people about this, and I'm like, you guys need to understand. If you work for me, you represent me, and I, if you don't take your yourself seriously, or you don't take your reputation seriously, I sure as fuck take my reputation seriously. Yeah, and you best understand that. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, it's you know it's a it's a cliche thing to say, but you, your name is all you have. Um, and you know, and, and, and if if you don't set out to represent your name in the best possible way to the to the highest level of competence that you can possibly produce, I, I don't I don't know what's getting you out of bed in the morning.
Yeah, man. I mean, there are people that just don't have a, a philo you know, just don't have philosophies in life. And mm -hmm. there's a reason why on our, if you open up our album, on our first album to bathe from the throat of cowardice, um, I made sure there are no thank you notes. There were no anything. I'm like, the only thing I want other than the necessary credits, is I just want the Napoleon Bonaparte quote. Uh, our only immortality is the memory we leave in the minds of men. Mm -hmm. and that's that's not just with your let's say i mean the whole you're trying to in my, the, to the best that i can understand it at this point in my life the purpose of life is to take the big ship of your species let's say the collective consciousness or whatever the habits the cultural habits of your of, of your people whatever and you try to take the little bit of weight that you have and you try to throw your body as hard as you can against the side of the ship that you want to just slightly uh, fucking just a teeny bit drift in the trajectory you want it to go in mm. and part of that coming to that realization is humbling that you are just this tiny little thing that has a very you know you're just a one of the rolling drops of water in the wave that's pushing the ship you know mm. but that's great that's freeing you take some burden off of yourself and doing it all and you just do what you can you know you pick your hill that you're going to die on and you die on it you know yeah. um but nobody wants to do that and people are looking for the way like well i don't want to die <laughs> it's like sorry dude isn't that you know sorry I was saying, that's, that's the, I was saying this game that's not an option that's that's, that's not, not an option ends. yeah, yeah. you got to be sorry you know like there is no but that's what we have we have a lot of people that dawdle or you know watch tv or watch instagram or just buy things until they die so they don't have to think about any of that stuff mm. Um, it's easier to do that than to live for something. And if, because to live for something is to die for something mm. and no one wants to die for anything, you know? Um, it's also, it's also terrifying how that mindset manifests in incredibly unhealthy behaviors and, and, and very poor decision-making in their, in their actual lives. Right. So you have this, you know, if you, you can take a couple of like a basic thing, the average, a very basic and potentially very boring thing. The average size of a pension pot in the UK right now, at last point that I read is 64,000 pounds. There's no possible way that someone retiring can live off of that. It's not, it's, it's just not physically possible. The government pension is going to be bankrupt inside of this decade. Same as social security, social security, the earmark for it to be bankrupt is 2026, 2027. Wow. Now, how the fuck do these people think? You know, it might be cool to live like, you know, you're 16 when you're 45 now. How do they think they're going to live when they're in their 70s? It's not cool to be 72 years old and work a deli counter at a fucking uh, Walmart because you can't, you know, you can't afford to keep the lights on otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole, you know, girl boss I'm I'm pleased to be single and and not have kids and I'm you know 45 years old movement that you see amplified by social media that's the same thing it's like okay when you it might be fun for you now when you're when you're in your 70s there's no one to look after you no one to take care of you do you think anyone's going to give a fuck about you then no they're not yeah yeah and and and, yeah. and a lot of this is an, is is a is an outgrowth of that. It's number one. It's feelings first. What makes me feel great right now? It's yeah. immediate gratification. Feelings first. Um, and then and then as you say, it's like it's just no real. There's no deep thing. There's no philosophy. There's just I want to get through today. Extract as much, you know, fast food quote unquote from it as I possibly can. You know, much short term gratification from it as I can. Rinse and repeat the next day. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, my, you know, where my glimmer of optimism comes in here, where the silver lining for me comes in is I think, um, you know, I think life is more cyclical than linear. So mm -hmm. I feel like we're, we're going through some very strange growing pains right now. And I think, uh, you know, social media is playing a big role in um, fast tracking a lot of the 
painful self exploration our species is having right now. And I think we're, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we're seeing women trying to explore their masculinity and we're even seeing men, more men exploring their femininity. Of course, this is a, this is going to show up in radical ways that will be confusing or um, some people will find objectionable or misguided. That's inevitable with anything, right? Um, but I do think that ultimately, hopefully, this, because men, men deal with this same issue of trying to be the man boss and, and being crippled by loneliness. And, yeah, 100%. and you know what I mean? So it's like women are kind of, they, they have to learn that lesson too. You know what I mean? Like it, it's totally natural to want to achieve your own autonomous power. That's a perfectly healthy goal, um, especially when you don't have any. And it's only through the wisdom that you achieve after that of being like, oh, fuck, why isn't this enough for me? I thought this was going to be enough. You know, like I even had that with vitriol. Like I'm at a place in my life where I'm my next thing is like, I want to have a family. You know, I did my selfish thing. I made the world that I can, that I'm the the boss of, you know, I, I, I became a world builder and I realized that's not enough for me. You know, like I need someone to, to take care of, you know, like I need in order to hopefully through any kind of masculine revelation, you realize it's not about power for power's sake. It's, it's, it's power in to be used in in the spirit of service you know like and that service can be to a lot of things you know your people your family your philosophy you know whatever but it's once you cultivate that power that you're blind you're blinded by powerlessness i don't think you can think of anything more important than power when you don't have any power and then when you get the power that's when it opens up your, you know, your imagination to be like, okay, now what do I, what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. Um, and you're, you're presented with kind of the emptiness of that instinct that you need to fill something once you have, it's just all part of the natural evolution, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, Anyway, that was another well, rabbit hole. So. What, you, what you're saying there, this will be a nice way to, to close it off. So uh, Thomas Sowell, who I, I absolutely love, mm -hmm. he has a fantastic, uh, fantastic quote. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. And you try in your life to get the best trade-off you can possibly get, and that's it. That's all you can hope for. That's it. Um, Brother, this was a fucking fantastic conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, really appreciate the time. And I am I'm very excited to see what Suffer and Become is going to do for this band and going to do for you. So, uh, you know, hopefully at some point you uh, you make your way over to the UK uh, and I can, uh, I can shake your hand. But, um, you know, hopefully we have another one of these as well at some point down the road. Well, hopefully, yeah, I'd love that. I'd like, I, you know, I had a... Again, I thank you for being patient with me. I'm uh, some days I'm more, art, you know, concise th than others, and I was a little uh, more scatterbrained than I'd like to be today. So thanks for being oh, you're, uh, you're, you're patient. Fine. Don't 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 worry about that.
I am placing early bets on the new vitriol record, Suffer and Become, uh, ranking very highly, if not featuring on the top spot of many, many best of 2024 lists. Uh, we may only be in February, but uh, this is an album that feels to me like a watershed moment in extreme music. Uh, it is absolutely extraordinary, and that conversation was absolutely extraordinary. I hope you all enjoyed it, and a big thank you and a shout out to Kyle for his time. He is definitely going to be back on the podcast again in some way, shape, or form. Um, we actually spoke afterwards and threw around a couple of uh, ideas that I'm rather excited about. Uh, but I will share details of that once it actually gets confirmed. Um, you just, you guys just keep watching the space. Uh, a couple of months ago, I shared the first single by a band called Grey, spelt G-R-E-H, uh, out of Germany. Uh, I say first single, they'd actually put out a couple of EPs, but it was a new single that they'd released, independent band. Of course, we show independent music a lot of love on Into the Necrosphere. News has now reached me of a forthcoming full-length album that they're going to be putting out uh, in the winter of this year. It's going to be called Dysphoric Devotion. They've got a brand new single out, which I am rather excited about which is why i'm taking the time to share it with you before we get to the news rant this song is called <laughs> thy breath not mine
That was a song called Thy Breath Not Mine. The band is out of Germany. They're called Grey. Uh, the song will be featured on their forthcoming full length entitled Dysphoric Devotion. Um, they have not yet confirmed an official release date, uh, but the release schedule is for winter of 2024. So great to hear them going from strength to strength. One of many independent bands uh, showcased on Into the Necrosphere. Uh, and I will also reissue the call. If you're in an unsigned band and you want to get your music heard, send it my way. The email address is into the necrosphere at gmail.com. I will not promise that I'm going to play every single band, but if I like what I hear, I will feature it on the show. Right now, my friends, if you think that Timothy Chalamet is a sharp dresser, then hit the bricks, because this is my weekly news rant. Round them up for judgment. and hang them where the world can see. All right, Legion. Uh, it is 12 noon on Saturday, the 17th of February, as I record this. Uh, we start on metalstorm.net as always. And the first um, headline catching my attention is that Suicidal Angels have unleashed a brand new single. It says here, two weeks prior to the official release of their eighth full-length album, uh, Profane Prayer, Greek Thrashers Suicidal Angels have launched a Manthos Stergiu created lyric video for the new single called Virtues of Destruction. It's been a while since I've actually properly listened to, uh, to Suicidal Angels. I remember when they first came out, um, I may have re reviewed possibly their first or second record for um, Chronicles of Chaos. And I do recall enjoying it. I don't think I was blown away by it, but I, it, it may have scored a solid 7 out of 10 interesting to uh, or it will be interesting to check in and see what they're sounding like these days so uh, let's listen to virtues of destruction Um, yeah, I think the, the 7 out of 10 score I gave them, and actually I recall now, the record that I reviewed was Eternal Domination, and it was about a 7 out of 10 that I gave that album. I, I think that may potentially, based on what I've just heard in the first 1 minute 22 seconds here, be the ceiling of what these guys are likely to achieve on, uh, on the old Jackie Smith Richter scale. Um, the riff is pretty good, the production is nice and open and organic, um, the vocals are alright. I think the problem is th this band is wearing their influences so openly on their sleeves. I don't really feel that they're offering anything new or anything interesting. There's nothing. There's nothing here that I, I, you know, wouldn't be able to delve back into several, you know, old school thrash bands as back catalogs and listen to, and not yet done in or, or executed far more proficiently than they've done yet. Um, like the, you know, you can tell. Just by the tone of the song, the way everything is delivered, you can tell there's a genuine sincerity here. Like, these guys really love what they do, and they love the style of music that they're making, and I think that's very cool. But, um, you know, it, it's it's just that, again, much like with many other subgenres of metal, they're entering a very crowded arena, and that crowded arena, I think, to be able to stand out, you need to be doing something that is different to what everybody else has done before you, or is currently doing and I just don't see how they tick the box really in, on, on either front. 
So um, not bad, but uh, not one that I think we we will gain anything from uh, from dwelling on for any uh, any further length of time. Uh, let's move on. Um, the next headline, Winter, have a live album coming out in April. It says here, nine years after their disbandment, SWAT Records are proud to announce the release of the first official live album from cult death do metal band Winter. Uh, entitled Live in Brooklyn, New York, it's going to be released on April the 19th, 2024. The official press release reads, uh, in August and September of 2012, Winter participated in the Power of the Riff East-West series of concerts held in California and New York after playing the West Coast shows with bands like Pelican Song and Nooth Grush, among others. I've never heard of Nooth Grush. Uh, Winter returned to their hometown, New York, on September the 2nd and played a show in Brooklyn's Warsaw concerts um, with their best lineup. Um, blah blah blah. A bit of excitement about uh, this this winter uh, live record on the old uh, socials, um, and I I kind of recall these guys possibly from a Death Is Just the Beginning compilation that they may have uh, featured on. It was either that or it might have been a Relapse record sampler, but um, I do know there's an awful lot of love for their debut record, Into Darkness. Um, so I would, you know, I would imagine there's quite a few people that are very excited to hear them putting out something live, even if it's not new studio material, it might be the precursor to new studio material. And, you know, that that is hopefully not going to be a bad thing. All right. Kitty have got a new single out. Obviously, as you can tell, I'm super hyped about this. Uh, it says here, 13 years after their last music release, I've Failed You, Canadian female metal crew Kitty now unveil a first music piece, the single called Eyes Wide Open. Check it out. Um, again, bizarrely, I've noticed some excitement for this release on X. I've noticed it, and, and X is a bit of a cesspool, so you, you kind of can, you know... It, it, excitement for bullshit is something that is not uncommon on x let's just put it that way but i've noticed some of this on on instagram as well and i i can't for the love of me figure out why i never really listened to much kitty i always kind of saw them as a mildly less terrible version of otep which is basically like saying passing multiple kidney stones is mildly less unpleasant than having your appendix removed <laughs> So, but that being said, I am now curious. I, I, I do want to hear what this sounds like and, you know, whether I've just been, whether I've been missing out uh, for all these years. Somehow, I don't think so, but um, we're going to find out. Uh, I mean, it's definitely not as, as atrocious as Otep. I mean, o Otep truly is music that is so bad lyrically and and musically that it, it's it they the kind of of act that I think if you list them as something that you enjoy, it, it, I would potentially stop the conversation with that person. I mean, that's every, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but that is just the worst of the worst. This is not nearly in the in that in the same vein as that fucking shitstorm or that dumpster fire, but um, you know it's there's nothing special about it. Um, and I, you know, this this to me kind of it reminds me of the trope that I suspect many of us, both men and women, are very very tired of, which is 
that nowadays, uh, certainly for the last, I'd say, in the last five years, it's been particularly bad for this, where if you don't openly embrace, um, you know, a female band or a movie that was made by a woman or a TV show that was made by a woman, you're immediately labeled a misogynist and a hater and a fanboy, uh, you know, and toxically masculine and whatever other, you know, fucking bollocks of the day they want to uh, tar and feather you with. Um, and that is just simply not true. Um, anybody who's listened to Enter the Necrosphere for any length of time knows I'm a you know, big fan of a great many female musicians, metal and otherwise. Um, but, uh, you know, good is good and bad is bad. It doesn't really matter, you know, whether they got the musicians, uh, you know, have a wee wee or a foo foo. So this is this isn't shit. It's it's not something that if somebody played it at um, you know at a house party, I'm gonna go you know I'm gonna stick a fucking screwdriver into the uh, into the speakers. But it's you know to to get all hyped and excited about this, it's kind of like the hype and excitement around um, True Detective season four, which by the way I've not yet watched a single minute of. But I, I've got to say, the more that this dialogue gains momentum online whereby any single time somebody has said anything bad about it then again they're 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 you know lumped in with the rest of the world's worst bigots uh that truly puts me off you know watching it whatsoever um you know and this is coming from somebody who you know obviously thoroughly enjoyed the first season i think the second season is excellent i think it's very underrated third season i think started off well i think it ended off on a weak note um and I was very excited about the fourth season, particularly because Jodie Foster is in it. I, you know, I was kind of hoping for shades of Clarice Starling uh, of Silence of the Lambs. Um, but uh, from everything I've heard so far, it's, it's you know, all style, no substance whatsoever. Uh, and that just puts me off completely. Um, and what puts me off even more is Isa Lopez, um, you know, who uh, produced this or, you know, actually was the director and I believe the writer as well. Um, seemingly taking offense to anybody who dares, no matter how big of a fan they were of the previous stuff, no matter how excited and how desperately they wanted season four to be great, somehow the default position is if you don't like it, you are scum. Um, so anyway, new kitty single, if that's your bag, you know, so be it, it's not mine. Uh, Coffins have announced that uh, their sixth long player is ready to be released. Japan's death metalers, Coffins, have returned with their crushing new album, Sinister Oath, uh, which they will release on March the 29th via Relapse Records, uh, two days after my birthday. To taste the first piece of it, check out the spontaneous rot track via the Bandcamp widget below. Uh, and by the way, um, during that wonderful time, a reminder to you all that I will be at Inferno Festival. Um, and uh, hopefully be interviewing a couple of folks, including a couple of names that were on the list of most requested guests that I uh, spoke to you all about last week. Um, I've still, I've not yet confirmed who I'm going to be speaking to when I'm there. Um, I think those logistics need to be ironed out uh, and will be ironed out over the coming weeks. Um, because I am a paranoid fucking superstitious bastard i will not be sharing any of the interview any of those names with any of you until i know for a fact that the video file of that interview is safely stored away on multiple hard drives so come what may you can actually see it but if you look at the lineup for inferno you can see there are a fair few bands that you know if i get to speak to folks from those bands we're going to have us a, a, a fun April, possibly a fun May. And then in June, we've got Fortress Festival, and there's a whole bunch of bands that I'm going to be interviewing from there as well. So uh, this year is just, in my view, taking on a life of its own as far as this podcast is concerned, and frankly, as far as the, uh, the extreme music scene is concerned as well. But anyway, I'm going to shut the fuck up, and let's hear what Spontaneous Rot sounds like.
there's part of me that that thinks this you know there's nothing to write home about yeah but there's part of me that is that's digging that that main riff actually that's frankly digging the whole vibe of the song um you know it's 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 incredibly simplistic but it's kind of charming in its simplicity uh if that makes sense it's like the the just the vibe the 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 gnarliness of that riff i quite like the vocals you know they remind me of um you know these kind of cavernous death metal bands that you get like grave miasma they kind of got that vibe but the music is more reminds me a little more of autopsy um so yeah i, I mean i wouldn't necessarily say i'm going to uh you know be waking up like a fucking kid on christmas morning on march the 29th wanting to hear sinister oath for the first time but uh it'll 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 most certainly be on the on the watch list um let's get back to it though Okay, that I liked. I like that well, as soon as they they as soon as the speed picked up a little bit, and they got to that scumbag beat. Is what, what Mike Hill refers to, and I think I think we're talking about the same thing. What he refers to as the scumbag beat, I fucking love. And when when that when that song picked up in tempo, um, it the coffin's stock climbed a couple of points in my view. So, not bad. You know, again, like I said, nothing nothing that I'm gonna be giddy over on the day of its release but definitely something that i'm going to place on uh, on the old watch list okay uh next headline black tusk are putting out a new full-length album in april uh it says yeah black tux black tux <laughs> black tusk are back with a new album announcement the georgia-based unity will unleash their new offering the way forward on april the 26th via season of mist it was produced engineered and mixed by chris scary adams mastered by uh brad boat at auto siege for a preview give a spin to the album's first track called brush fire i want to die. love it um it's got that anarchic like it's it's got that spontaneous feel to it where you know there's a certain bands that you know dabble in this sort of hardcore punk crust vibe and mix it with that with those sludge and and, and do metal influences where when they do it right like black tusk has done here it just sounds to me like shit can pop off at a moment's notice like you can imagine this is going to be so much fun to hear live um and frankly this is great workout music there's just a there's a nastiness to it i know the band called themselves or they refer to themselves as swamp metal and and the last time i really paid much attention to them was the 2016 record that they put out pillars of ash um and for whatever reason uh tcbt which they put out two years later it kind of passed me by i do think i need to revisit that uh it has also been a while since these guys have put out anything but uh yeah i'm uh, I'm, I'm liking that very much um you know again you know you're not going to hear crazy innovation from them but again they've got a simple formula or simple blueprint and they execute it to a turn uh and uh, what what they offer i'm digging
top notch absolute top notch that that preamble to the the sequence that we just listened to now where i mean i don't know whether it was a guitar effect that they used or a sample but w whatever it was it worked fucking brilliantly um and i think that is unequivocally a top notch song okay um moving on we get to profanatica who are streaming a new video for the song take up the cross uh, this comes off their sixth full length came out last year. It's called Crux Simplex, um, a record I enjoyed very much. Um, some of my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse enjoyed it even more. And um, one of the or the most senior member of our um, uh, of our ranks or amongst our ranks. And I don't say that because uh, of his age. I say that because he, he hosts the longest running podcast amongst the horsemen, as you know, the great Mike Hill, um, host of Everything Went Black and uh, Necromaniacs. He is on tour currently with Profanatica uh, with his band Tombs. So if you're in the US um, and you uh, you are anywhere near any of the venues uh, that they're playing at, um, then go check out one of those dates because I reckon that's going to be a fucking absolutely stomping show. So um, I, I we have heard the record. Most of people listening to um, the the news round probably have heard the uh, have heard the album by now. I really enjoyed the record uh, and I'm keen to see what this video looks like. So we'll give it 60 seconds. Cool music video. If you like that song, you absolutely need to check out the rest of Crux Simplex if you haven't done so already. Um, it's all in that vein. Um, one thing to say, just because the music video reminded me of it, uh, Paul Ledney, otherwise known as uh, Mayhemic <laughs> Slaughter of the Heavens, um, I have to tip my hat to him. I cannot, I can't conceive of what it would be like to play drums and do vocals. Uh, there's very, very few people that do it, and, you know, they, that is, I think, for very good reason. Uh, you know, he does it very well, uh, and, and as I said, that album is really good as well, so. Okay, next up, Merciful Fate are releasing their next album in 2025, uh, although Merciful Fate got back together nearly five years ago, it says. The iconic Danish heavy metal band hasn't issued a studio album since 1999's Nine. New music, oh, sorry, new bassist Becky Baldwin, who joined last month, confirmed in a new interview with That Metal Interview podcast. The release date of the band's new album has been pushed back to 2025 so that frontman King Diamond can concentrate on his upcoming, sorry, on his namesake band's upcoming record, The Institute. So looking forward to that, um, Matteo from Bewitcher is on the podcast next week, and he and I spoke about uh, Merciful Fate and Venom and, you know, evil-sounding records um, to uh, quite a bit of length. So uh, we, uh, if, you, if you're down with that kind of music, make sure you check out next week's episode. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm excited to hear what they do. I will say, for me, still King Diamond peaked on Conspiracy, and I don't really think that any of the albums that he did beyond that necessarily came anywhere close to conspiracy's genius um like the con the conspiracy and them um you know those two records back to back to me was just absolutely fucking staggeringly good uh and to this day they're great the eye is also very very good as well um uh, but then from there the spider's lullaby eh, the graveyard eh, voodoo shite house of god it was just a real disappointment and even when they were doing the sequel to abigail when they did abigail to the revenge uh, i know there were a few folks that like that but i just couldn't uh, i couldn't get with it 
Uh, but them and Conspiracy, to me, masterpieces. Absolute masterpieces. Onfod have premiered a new single called Farnsgeit. Uh, Black Metalers Onfod have launched an official music video for Farnsgeit, uh, the new advanced single coming off their uh, upcoming EP, Old Fod. The latter drops on April the 5th, 2024, via Black Lion Records. Let's give it a listen. So quickly, I think I may have butchered their name when I introduced this uh, this um, song. Uh, they're not on FOD, they're on FOD. Uh, be that as it may, I do recall very clearly uh, having them on the news rant or featuring them on the news rant when Carl Icara was on last year and we listened to a single off of their 2023 record uh, that Oster Botniska Morkret uh, and, I, and I recall liking it. I did not like it, and I, I did actually listen to the whole album. I didn't like anything on the album quite as much as I like this single, even though we're only 60 seconds in. This is fucking brilliant. Absolutely hitting all of the beats that I like when it comes to black metal. Angry, spiteful, vitriolic, vile. It's just, it's you know, there's just a nastiness to it that, that speaks to me. So I, I love this, love it so far. Holy shit. No, that is fucking sensational. Beyond top notch. Um it it that it builds up when when um the, the vocalist is doing that shout um and then when it goes into that black metal beatdown that we just paused on now, I mean it's just that is one million percent up my street. Fantastic whatever happened between the record and and this ep keep, you know keep doing that keep drinking that elixir because it is uh it is doing you guys the world of good that is fucking sensational my friends uh i try which i know i've already said but make sure that you check out on fod post haste and well done to black lion records for signing that band um Okay, uh, next up, we've got Construct of Leith, who have signed a deal with Transcending Obscurity Records. Um, it says here, Woodbridge, Virginia-based experimental and atmospheric death metal unit Construct of Leith and Transcending Obscurity Records have joined forces and signed a new contract for the release of a new full-length album, which is going to be entitled A Kindness Dealt in Venom. I like that, I like that title. Uh, you can listen to two songs in advance via YouTube down under. Um, Transcending Obscurity Records, a label that has received much love on uh, Into the Necrosphere, on the News Rant in particular. A couple of fucking great bands on that label, particularly in my view, uh, Veilburner. Uh, they've got a couple of others as well. Veilburner is the main one that comes to mind. Um, I have never heard Constructive Leith before, but uh, we are going to hear what a track called Denial in Abstraction sounds like. Do it for the suffering! 
There is no fucking way that anybody can argue with me after hearing that song that we are not in an extraordinary time for extreme metal music. Um, I've never heard of these dudes before, and I i mean, that is just fucking fantastic. Those discordant riffs sound, you know, just fit so well against the, the, the blasting drums, those vocals have kind of this urgency and this aggression to them that I absolutely love. Um, there's a there's a darkness to the music that you know for me is critical when it comes to great death metal. Um, there's kind of a rawness to the way that they deliver that as well. Uh, yeah, that's just a winner for me from bell to bell. Um, how, how the rest of the record will end up sounding like we will we will find out. But good God, man. I mean, we've this news rant's been going out for 40 minutes, and think about how many great songs we've listened to. There's been some muck in between, but um, there's been some fucking absolutely tier one bands that I've never heard of before. Uh, some of you may have done, um, but uh, yeah, I just it, this is the fun of the news rant. You just keep discovering new shit all the time. Uh, but yeah, kudos to Construct of Leith for that song. And uh, congratulations to Transcending Obscurity for signing them, because uh, I think they've picked up uh, another um, potentially winning prospect. What I like as well is they, they're clearly not afraid to color outside the lines, creatively speaking. There's a lot of atmosphere here. They do some, I mean, there's like a, that, that slightly experimental bit that we just heard there now. Um, it says here that, um, or the band comment, the album is a big leap for us in terms of composition and instrumentation, which is why we're so glad to be working with Transcending Obscurity. Their commitment to only putting out top tier work and their willingness to take a chance on experimentation within the framework of extreme metal are extremely important to us. So we're very pleased to sign with them and we can't wait to release the new album. I am fucking excited about that. Uh, very, very much looking forward to this record. Um, so yeah, when it, when it comes out, I don't know, but that is brilliant. Um, let us move on now, my friends. We are, we've not yet come to the new Deerside single. Um, hopefully it turns up in a second, or I might actually just jump across to uh, YouTube. Um, and let's, let's give it a quick listen. Um, just, just to ensure that we, uh, we stay within, you know, a reasonable time frame. You know, I know there's only so much of your time that I can command over the course of the week. I have, of course, heard the song. So, you know, this is not going to be a, a you know, a first reaction as 99.9% .9 of everything else that I do on the news rent is. Uh, but I did want to talk about this because it is, an, in my view, a massive step up from the first single that they put out. Um, that first single they put out 
the more I went back and listened to it, the more I just found it to be completely and utterly mediocre. Now, we're going to talk in a second about the uh, the controversy around the album cover art. And this time, the controversy uh, isn't quite as uh, incendiary or as God-bothering as the controversy that they had around the cover art for Once Upon a Cross. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's listen to 60 seconds of the new single uh, called Sever the Tongue. Uh, and then I'll give you guys my candid thoughts. On, uh, on what I'm hearing. So this to me is Deerside playing to their strengths. Um, you've got Glenn's vocals sounding a lot more organic, a lot more raw, and a little bit more unhinged than it sounded certainly in that first single they put out off of uh, the album. And the album, by the way, is called Banished by Sin, in case you've been living under a rock and you don't know what it's called. Uh, it is out on April the 26th via Raining Phoenix Music. First single, like I said, did not, didn't cut the mustard, but this definitely does. These vocals sound great, like I said. Uh, I think the riff sounds cool. There's a nastiness and there's an aggression to it that, you know, kind of throws back to the first uh, record, maybe to Once Upon a Cross as well. Um, and then I, I really like that little bit of melody that they throw into, I don't know whether it's a pre-chorus, whether, whether you want to call it a pre-chorus or a chorus, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, the only thing that I think is slightly misguided about the track is I don't like the, the intro. The intro reminds me a little bit of... Um, the intro they did to a song called Fuck Your God that was on Scars of the Crucifix. And, and actually, that wasn't a bad song either. The intro just seemed to kind of be pointless. It just seemed to be tacked on. And it, it was kind of like they, they had a song. They didn't really know how to get the song started properly. Uh, and so they just wrote this nonsense in three seconds and kind of, you know, that's how the song got started. And it, is, it, it feels slightly similar to me, yeah. But... It, it does not take away from the fact that it's it's great to actually hear a fucking cool dear side song uh, that is uh, that is yet to be released or that that is being released this side of the 21st century but um, let's get back to it So while old man Glenn is slicing the tongues uh, from the mouths of various priests and nuns, um, let's talk about the um, let's talk about the solo first of all, because for me, Deerside have kind of had two eras of soloing. So they had 
the you know crazy unhinged fucking lunacy that the Hoffman brothers brought to the table and that worked particularly effectively in my my opinion of the first and second records uh, especially also actually on Once Upon a Cross but first album especially I mean those those solos to me didn't sound like something that someone had sat down and carefully constructed it was literally like they were possessed by the devil and they just started wailing away on as many notes as they possibly could B brilliant then Ralph Santola came into the band for uh, the Stench of Redemption, and I really liked the melody that he brought to the table. Like he had a very much more like a classic heavy metal guitar style, and again, I think it worked really, really well. And then when he passed on, um, and and was no longer in the band, um, the the solos just became very nondescript to me. I mean, it was probably in tandem with much of the rest of the music, like. There are some good songs on those, um, you know, those kind of post till death do us part dear side records, um, you know, and, and those being to hell with God uh, in the minds of evil and overtures of blasphemy. I, and I thought all of them had two or three songs that you'd listen to and you'd go, OK, this is this is decent. This is decent dear side music. But um, what I will definitely say is I'm not sure who wrote the guitar solo for this particular song, but this is definitely a nice middle ground between the, the melodic and the chaotic uh, and I think it suits the band really well now what doesn't suit the band uh, this AI album cover that they've done uh, I am not down with whatsoever um, Nathan Glover of Gravier posted um, a comment about this on the Into the Necrosphere Facebook page um, and I completely agree with everything he said the gist of it was that it smacks of laziness. And if you imagine a band of Deicide's profile and stature, there are hundreds of very capable, highly competent and talented and gifted artists floating around all over social media who would happily have painted them something magnificent to have as an album cover. And yet for some fucking insane reason, they chose to have this... AI generated piece of shit that looks like box art from the first Diablo game from back in 1997 or 1996 or whenever the hell that came out and it just feels like it just feels like laziness and the problem is if they're lay you know like Nathan made the point and I agree with him if you don't if if you have no investment in the overall product that you're presenting to your fans, how are we to trust that you had any investment in the music? Um, so that to me is a is a is a real miss. I, I don't know who made the decision to do that. I don't know who pointed them in, in, in the direction of whatever you know app fucking bullshit generated that garbage art. It's not as embarrassing as uh, the the last cattle decapitation uh, records art, albeit that that was actu an actual artist that did that, which is even more terrifying. Um, but it, it it sucks. It's just not it's not what I want to see from a tier one band like Deicide. Now again, that also brings me to the next question. If we listen to sever the uh, sever the tongue. Last week I spoke to the Skeletal Remains gang about legends that are still performing at the highest of high levels. Would I? Would I, if I had to stack rank the old guard, um, would I place Deicide in, you know, the upper echelons alongside Suffocation, um, uh, Cryptopsy, Dying Fetus, you know, like death metal bands that in my view are still delivering work that is, you know, of a just master, that is, that is a masterclass. Album in, album out, everything they put out is fucking sensational. I don't know. The jury's out on that, and I'm I'm curious to hear what the rest of Banished by Sin ends up sounding like, but uh, Sever the Tongue gets me nearer to believing this may well be a return to form um, than uh, the previous song that, oh, that was called, for reference, Bury the Cross with Your Christ. That song just did not cut the mustard. I hope that that was an anomaly on the record, um, and I suspect that whoever made the decision to put that out as the first single was probably also the person that uh, made the decision to have uh, an AI cover. And, you know, I'm not going to wag the finger and say for shame, dear side, but come on. You know, you could have you could have dropped Matt Prizzo a DM or um, Jason um, Pepiat from Psychroptic. You could have you could have hit him up. I fucking promise you that those guys would have done something for dear side for free, which would have looked incredible.
Anyways, uh, there's another new track that I want us to listen to as well. And I know we're, we're coming on to the top of the hour. So uh, uh, definitely wanted to make sure we, we have time for this. Uh, High on Fire have put out a new single called Burning Down. Um, they are finally putting out a new record. You all know my thoughts on High on Fire. Again, last week uh, I referenced Matt Pike as probably one of my favorite um my favorite riff writers on the face of the earth, and honestly, with good reason, the guy is a fucking genius. One of the best guitarists ever, in my view. Uh, let's hear what Burning Down, the new single of the forthcoming record, Cometh the Storm, sounds like. I mean, I'm highly biased when it comes to High on Fire. They have never released a record over the course of, I mean, I think this is probably their seventh or eighth album, maybe even more so than that. Well, they may have put out more than that, but they've never released a, a record that I think is anything less, any, worth any less than nine out of 10. I think Matt Pike is one of the greatest and most gifted guitarists and musicians uh, walking the face of the earth. He is criminally underrated. And on top of that, as pertains to this single, I love when they slow things down more so than I enjoy. I mean, I do enjoy the, the faster stuff like, you know, Electric Messiah kind of had that motorhead kind of vibe uh, to it intentionally. So and I like that stuff, but um, it's it's not as cool to me as when they slow this down. This song to me feels like there's a bit of a throwback to the first and second record. Uh, so the art of self-defense. Uh, and surrounded by thieves it has that southern fried warm kind of analog desert rock kind of feel uh if you guys know what i mean that's the i i i i feel like i'm on a this is music for a road trip um you know a road trip through the desert like you know on a hot day you know sitting around with your bros barbecuing and having some beers this is the kind of music you're going to be playing in the background and i fucking love it love it i think matt sounds superb i mean his guitaring sounds great the production sounds fucking fantastic and lest anybody comment on it yes i know the music video was made uh by ai um i was uh you know railing on dear side for doing an album cover uh, through ai but to me that's different uh, you know, a music video through AI, how is that different to a lyric video? Um, you know, I know the lyric videos aren't produced by AI, but I don't really give a fuck about that. I mean, the, the, the days of MTV and you sitting around watching a music video and going, oh, I wonder what they're going to show us this time around. That's, you know, that's fucking, that's yesteryear's business. So, you know, I don't care if a band does a music video through AI. I frankly prefer it to uh, the countless music videos that we've been inflicted with over the course of the last couple of years, you know, that feature an old man running around in his fucking Calvin Kleins uh, while some dude dressed as a barbarian <laughs> chases him through the woods. Uh, it, that, that sort of stuff doesn't interest me. And like I said, I don't care what a music video looks like. Um, the album cover is much more important to me. 
that's just my that's just my position on that but my position on the song is that it is fucking absolutely no questions asked unequivocally top notch uh let's give it another 60 seconds What a year this is going to be. We've got new music by High on Fire, uh, My Dying Bride. Um, I mean, you know, a fucking shitload of bands that I could list if uh, my old <laughs> coffee-addled brain could could recall them all. But I mean, it's like, you know, there's just one cool thing after the other coming over the course of the next couple of months. Feelers have already been put out for me to uh, get Matt Bike on the podcast. I don't know whether it's going to happen, of course. Uh, but I sent a very sincere and groveling email to uh, their uh, their PR folks uh, saying that I understand that every asshole with a dictaphone is going to be, you know, messaging you the exact same thing. But, uh, you know, spare, spare a thought for a, a wee little South African lad whose dream it has been since he started into the necrosphere to have Matt Pike on as a guest. So we'll see what happens. I sent feelers out for Aaron Stainthorpe as well. You guys can help, though, by making sure that if you buy any of these guys' music on Bandcamp or if you're on the socials and you're commenting on anything... If you happen to, you know, drop the old note in there saying, you know, make sure you go on into the necrosphere or you're a, sh- or you're a piece of shit, <laughs> that might motivate them to listen. Uh, on that note, my friend, uh, or my friend, my friends, we've had, uh, we've had our hours worth of news uh, ranting and shit talking. So uh, I think that about wraps it up for this week. We are at the end of another episode of Into the Necrosphere. I want to say thank you very much if you have stuck around this far. Uh, I also want to say a big thank you to Carl Rasmussen for his time. Make sure that you check out the new Vitriol record. It's called Suffer and Become, in case you needed reminding. I'm going to close out this week's episode with something I think many of you thought was uh, previously unthinkable. But if you paid special attention over the course of the conversation, I don't think it's going to come as a surprise. I'm going to hit you guys with a uh, a one two six feet under combo uh we're starting off with torture killer off the album maximum violence and then we're finishing off we're rounding out with still alive off of uh, the classic album haunted uh chris barnes may not be upon the throne of death metal vocalists any longer as a matter of fact uh he's very very far from that throne nowadays but uh it's easy to forget in light of the atrocity that was the last Six Feet Under album, that back in the day, these guys used to churn out some pretty goddamn sensational music. Uh, And so we're going to listen to that uh, by way of closing out this episode. Whatever it is that you're doing and wherever it is that you are, Legion, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you bad motherfuckers again next week.
Yeah. 